could create something and, you know, unexpected consequences could result from that. I really hope not. Really, for me, I hope not. <laughs> well, unexpected consequences have always been with us. This is not something new. As a matter of fact, something like literacy, which we generally admire, drastically changed human beings. Imagine what life was like when we didn't read, we as a species. It was very different. Marshall McLuhan wrote several books about this. So anytime we invent a technology, there are always unexpected consequences. We made the Arab world as powerful as it is today because we chose with our automobiles around the turn of the 19th into the 20th century to have them be fueled by gasoline, by an oil product, rather than electricity. At the time, no one knew that that would happen. So we have to always be prepared for unexpected consequences. Sometimes they're good, sometimes they're bad. The key is always being flexible and being willing to, what I call, put in a remedial technology. We don't have to accept the negative consequences. One last example, when the window was invented, it was a marvelous invention because people could look outside and they didn't get rained on, they didn't get cold. But the window had the unexpected consequence of inventing the peeping Tom, where somebody could walk by and look at our window. So what do we do? We say, okay, let's just forget about these windows, bad idea, we'll just board them up. No, we invented Venetian blinds, curtains, window shades. So remedial technologies are there for us to develop and deploy when we discover an unwelcome, unintended consequence. Right, but Paul, one of the things that we've talked about today is what happens when you have an accelerated pace? You know, when the wheel was invented, you had a little time to correct the problem if you started going downhill too fast. You had thousands and thousands, millions of years. But now, all of a sudden, the locomotive's going hundreds of miles an hour. I mean, anybody, you know, we're very optimistic about science. So when social media, for example, were invented, what a great idea. You can meet all your friends at the bar and have a good time that night. You don't have to call them all up until cyberbullying takes place. And now all of a sudden, well, it's not so great necessarily to have everybody know everything about you every minute and not be able to squeeze the toothpaste back in the tube. So it's a lot harder now when you have these very optimistic opportunities for technology, these new inventions that are so great, and then you jump into them and go, Whoa, wait a minute, how do we pull all those, you know, how do we herd those squirrels back into the corral, to mix metaphors? And that's one of the things that, again, I keep going back to is, you know, when I had my iPhone, one day a friend of mine said, I got a problem. He said, he said my girlfriend wants me to put, find my iPhone on her iPhone. I said, meaning? He said, she wants to know where I am all the time. You know, so he, you know, unfortunately, you know, he's not a very ethical guy started making videos of him doing things so that he could send her videos and say, no, no, really, I was at the drugstore. I said, you know, Ed, you, you, you can't be this unethical. But, but I, it made me laugh because I realized that we're in situations all the time where now when we make a, a scientific step, we really, really have to think about the ethics. Way more than I think we ever had to before because it's so harder, so much harder to come up with the Venetian blinds that will solve whatever problem that comes up that we didn't expect. I, I completely agree with you about that, but one of the things I would also say is that um, what part, part of what makes science so innovative is because we don't have really strong re regulatory controls over everybody and right. what they can do. So in some ways we need to have that freedom that allows everyone to sort of engage in technology development on their own, in their own garage, et cetera. And what we hope is that all of us uh, many of us, uh, on the whole, are good, and we're trying to sort of develop these things for, for right. betterment of humankind. And I think that's one of the th difficulties is sort of regulation versus freedom. I, I also think um, we often are in silos, like you're a chemistry major, you're a biology major, uh, but we need to hyphenate a lot of those things. And I've been taking uh, some MIT folks over to India and working with some of the best coders in college who've never worked with doctors. And I bring doctors to them and connect people who are orthogonal, who don't have a connection, and I have the doctors 
tell them their pain points in terms of serving their patients. And I have these engineers who just know how to write code, do rapid prototyping with devices, and they're coming up with innovations. And that we need to create more places in society where people can imagine and, and experiment and fail. And if the biologists and the chemists aren't talking to one another and aren't talking to the people who are in other fields, you're not going to have the kind of innovation that, that we deserve.